through the call. Um, all right, so yeah, papers due Thursday, end of day on Blackboard. If you have an extension, you can either email it to me or you can uh, post it on the Blackboard a couple days late. The link should stay open. It'll be marked late, but I won't take off points if you have an extension. All right. Um, how's everyone holding up? I feel like now is a good time to pause and ask if everyone's still alive and well. Most of the people I've been talking to in the past few days, like outside of this, uh, are feeling like me, which is to say that everyone is feeling like they're a potato. And something about this weather combined with uh, COVID is making more and more people feel like potatoes. So I hope that you are not feeling as much like a potato as I am. Um, I'm not quite sure why I feel like a potato or what exactly it is. I just know that I feel like a potato. Um, so hopefully you feel less like a potato. Um, anyway, what I want to do today is just finish off what we started talking about last time with dual process theory. Uh, and then that's about it, is just talk about what dual process theory is. Hopefully this class will be a little more interactive than some of them. If you didn't do the readings because you've been working on other stuff, shouldn't be too much of a problem today. Uh, if you're feeling like a potato, we should still be able to get some stuff done. Um, all right, so let's just review what we talked about last time. So what did we talk about last time? Flat-footed question, just from, I don't feel like hearing my own voice. What did we talk about last time? It was a the whole language thing. of thought. Yeah, language of thought. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, language of thought hypothesis, which was this idea that we think in a language similar to a computer code, or when you're thinking about how the mind works, you should think about it as a com computing system like a computer that has things written in code. And what it is to think is to move from one line of code to the next line of code. So, you know, what is it to think like, have the thought, I like Susie, so I like someone. It would be to have a, the, the thought like, and this is me, and then here's Susie. So it's just to have this thought, and then the transition to me like someone. That's all thinking is, is just transitioning from here to here. Um, all right. So at the end of class though, and so we talked about Fodor's reasons, and this was basically his way of cashing out um, representational theory of mind and saying that if we explain things in terms of language of thought, we can explain why uh, you can transition from one thought to another. Why if you can have, think one thought like, I like Susie, then it's very easy to think another thought like I like Fred. However, at the end, if Fodor was right and everything's in terms of language of thought, we had this problem. What was the problem with following Fodor and thinking everything is done in terms of language of thought? The way to think is just a computer running a logical program. Anyone remember the issues? Well, we did those questions. Yeah. And what those questions were designed to do is basically, if you run a computer program correctly and you design it correctly, will the computer ever make a mistake? No. No, computers never, as long as you program it correctly, like get a calculator and ask it 2,222 plus 3,333. If you ask it a million times, every single time you're gonna get the same answer. That's just the way a computer works. No matter if you ask it about 2,222 cows and add 3,333 cows, how many cows do you end up with? Or if you're talking about horses, or if you're talking about money, or if you're talking about toes, like it doesn't matter what you're talking about, the computer's always gonna get it right. However, therefore, if we're running like computers, we should always get it right. If questions have the same format, then we human beings should always get them correct. However, what those questions last time were designed to show is that we don't always get them correct. So as a reminder, if I ask you what's more likely that somebody's child is gonna be a girl or someone's child is gonna be an albino girl, everyone got it right, the correct answer is girl. But if I give you a description of somebody who loves law and order and uh, thinks that the most important issue in the upcoming election is uh, funding for the police, and then I ask you, is this person more likely to be a cop or to be a cop voting for Trump? This is the exact same question as the last one. And the correct answer is they're more likely to be a cop because cop is a larger set that contains the smaller set of cops voting for Trump. 
Yet our mind very often will get this wrong. And more than half the people you ask this question to are going to give the wrong answer, namely that this person's more likely to be a cop voting for Trump. And so what gives? Why is it, if we're computers like Fodor says, why is it that we make mistakes that a computer would never make? And this is where dual system or dual process came in. So what did I say at the end of class? We said there were three ways you could respond to these issues. Option one, you just throw Fodor out and say, despite all the good things, he's wrong at the end of the day. And so that is the approach that uh, we're not going to take because that's basically the approach that we took for the first few weeks talking about you go behaviorist or you go materialist, eliminativist. And so we want to, though, keep some parts of Fodor around because he is right in a lot of ways. There's a lot of useful stuff. Option two is you say that despite appearances, despite the mistakes we make, Fodor is entirely correct and that we make mistakes even like we're still computer programs and we're still always running computer programs in our minds. However, the reason we make mistakes is something else. There's some other explanation for it. Or you can chart this middle ground. And this middle ground is what? Well, it's in the phrase dual process or dual system. So what is the dual system answer to this or the dual process answer? Give you a clue, it's in the word dual. What is, if you say dual or duo, how many are you talking about? Two, yeah, two. So the idea is the response of the dual process people is to say that, all right, Fodor's right about some things. He's right. We do sometimes think logically. We do sometimes think in this rule-based way, but that's not the only way we think, or that's not the only way our mind processes. In fact, there are two different systems that run in parallel at the same time in our mind. And while one of them operates in exactly the way Fodor says, this other one is operating in the background in a very different way. And what we see with these sorts of problem questions like the one we asked about last time is that one of the systems gives one answer, the other system gives the other answer, and we go with the one that's wrong. And so the way to say the idea here is that dual systems, there are two systems running in our head. And to give them nice names, they are generally called system one and system two, just because there's two of them, it's simple, it's straightforward. So what dual process or dual system theory believes is that Fodor's right about some of our thought, but not all of it. So that's the general background here. Why do we make the mistakes we do? Because we only are you, because we're using two systems. And in one case, we're using the system that gets the answer wrong. And so this is gonna make a lot more sense when we flesh it out a bit more, but this is the general idea. You don't have a mind, you've got in a certain sense, two minds that operate together in different ways by different methods. And what you are is a conglomeration of these two. So um, just a point of note, I have system one slash process one and system one slash process two, uh, or system slash process two. Uh, why is there a slash here? Well, because different, Theorists who believe this sort of thing uh, phrase it differently. And there's a big debate about how you should think of these. Are these, are there literally different parts of the mind, like structurally speaking, where one operates one way, or is it more that they're integrated, but it's just they use different methods? And so basically, though, the key is that there's two of them. At the end of the day, that's the key idea behind dual process theory. So everyone on board with this, just what we're talking about. Now, the key of dual process theory is. It basically defines the two systems or the two processes in terms of certain key characteristics. And the idea is that any type of thinking or mental processing is going to fall into one of these two buckets. And so the basic idea here is system two is the type of thinking or the type of reasoning that Fodor is talking about with the language of thought. It is rule based. It is slow, methodical. You move from one line to the next in a very orderly way. It requires attention and focus. It takes effort. To think in this way, you need to put in effort. And it's also tied in with this feeling of agency. When you think you're the one solving the problem, you're thinking in a system two way. And when you reach an answer in a system two way, uh, this is what it is to think in the way Fodor talks about. All right, system one, 
by contrast, is associative. It happens very quickly. It generally happens without you even realizing it's happening. And it takes little to no effort. It just feels like it happens. And because of that, it doesn't necessarily feel you're the one doing it. It just feels like it is happening. Now, right now I'm speaking in terms of generalness. Now what I want to do for the rest of the class is literally just go through each individual defining feature and talk about the evidence that theorists give that there is this system one uh, operating in the background and that it is running in a different way. And that when we run into problems like the ones we were talking about, um, what we're going to see is that you can give an explanation of what's gone wrong is your system one is giving a different answer than your system two. And for various reasons, you're going with your system one answer because it comes more quickly, et cetera, et cetera. So Shari asks, is it your subconscious thought? So one thing that dual process theory generally goes with is there's this idea that in the background, what is happening, these system one thoughts are generally unconscious processing that is happening. And so the idea is that um, while system two, I avoid talk of conscious and unconscious because it's a mess and it just makes my head hurt. Uh, my my own personal theory of consciousness is that it's magic and we'll never understand it and I'm too lazy to spend time doing it. But yes, the idea is very often that unconscious processing is system one processing, while system two processing is conscious, which is why it requires attention and effort. So the idea is that um, one other feature of dual process theory is intuitively in our everyday thought, we think of system two as the main way we think. We think that most information processing is done consciously, that we are in charge of it, that we make our decisions. One of the keys of dual process theory is, very, is, is that most processing is of type one or system one processing. So one of the features here is why do we make so many mistakes? Well, we make so many mistakes because most of the time we're running this simpler, easier, less cost effect, or yeah, less, more cost effective, less cost demanding system one processing. And unless we have good reason to go with system two, we go with the system one. Um, but yeah, uh, yes, Kaywin, this is exactly thinking fast and slow. In fact, that was the reading. Uh, so yeah, this is thinking fast and slow. This is Kahneman, this is Tversky, this is all that sort of stuff. So if you've read thinking fast and slow, you've done the reading for this week. Um, all right, so here's the background. Uh, what I want to do, as I said, is just go through, and the idea is that if you actually look at how humans think, we should see evidence of two different styles, and what we should see is cases in which the two are in conflict, and when they're in conflict, that should be able to explain the sorts of mistakes we make. So, uh, first off, associative versus rule-based. What do I mean by rule-based? What does it mean to follow rules? To follow like, you know, like a logistical rule, like, you know, with the questions that we just saw before, if we were to go rule based, then we would have said off that rule based that they'd be more likely that there were cops and a cop supported Trump. Yeah, and the, the idea is basically just like, it's literally think about a recipe for, yeah, it's tied in with the rules of logic, right? Yeah, so the idea is just that you are following rules as if you were a computer program or, uh, imagine you're following a recipe. You literally just go first, you do one. And once one is done, you do two. And you have to go slowly and procedurally. So you can think of like solving a math problem. Back when you had to do long division or like a very long, you know, whatever that's math that I totally forget, it's you write out each and every line and you f apply a rule here and then you apply a rule here and then you apply a rule here, et cetera. What do we mean by association? What is associative? What does it mean for two things to be thought associatively? How many people have heard this term in the context of psychology? Associationism or associative learning or... So here's the best way of thinking of associative. I'm going to put a word up on the board and I want you to shout out the first thing that pops in your head. Or I'm going to put a phrase. Shout out the first thing that goes in the blank. Cheese. Right, and cheese, that's one. What are some others that go in here? Anyone have anything else immediately pop into their head? Butter. 
Butter, that's another really common one. Water might be another one. Uh, milk, that might be another. These are all things. Why did that pop on your in your head? Milk and coffee, or bread and coffee, that's another good one. Describe why this happened in your head. Like, what happened exactly? Because, I thought, like, oh, oh, Muhammad. So, um, because we got kind of like, uh, got used to it. So, like, for bread, and we know, like, what we want, like, what would go, go along with it. But how many of you had to think really long and hard about this question? Anybody? Did anyone have to, like, run? No, it just kind of popped in your head. And this is Ray saying knowledge is a network. And this is exactly what this is designed to show. It's not, why is it that, let's go with the butter example, because that just happens to be the one that pops in my head first. Why is it that if I see bread, I immediately think butter? Is it because I run a rule in my head? No, it's just because whenever I've seen the word bread in the past, it's very often associated with the word butter. They happen next to each other. Also conceptually, butter is what you put on bread. So when I think about bread, I immediately think about butter. Um, here's another one. Fork. Sword would be one. Fork is another one. These sorts of things, these aren't things that pop into your, like take a while. Here's another one. Duck. Duck is one. What's another one? Trump or duck, those are the two most common ones. And why? Because when we've seen the word Donald in the past, it's usually been followed by duck. It's not like King Donald III of Scotland. Like these aren't things that we commonly think about. It's rather what we're used to seeing. So the idea here with associationism is it's based on this idea that things that we've experienced together often go together. And they go together in our minds simply because we've experienced them before. So um, how many people are familiar, like this idea of associationism and associative learning? Um, how many people are familiar with Pavlov's experiments? Uh, Nadia, <laughs> yeah, so um, that's a good one. Uh, Nadia says she tries not to think about Trump, which is why the duck was the first one in her mind. I wish I could have that much self-control. Um, how many people are familiar with Pavlov and his dog experiments? Okay, anyone, anyone familiar with these? Uh, all right, so Pavlov's dog experiments. Basically, here's how the experiment went. And this sort of classical conditioning is basically just, the experiments were the ones that came up with classical conditioning, which is a case in which one stimulus causes a non-behavioral non response. It just causes something. So for instance, in the actual experiment, here's what Pavlov did. He got a whole bunch of dogs. And this was happening in Russia in like the early 20th century, late 19th century. So he was able to do all sorts of fucked up things with the dogs. But basically what he did was he tied the dogs down and he would ring a bell and then give them some food. And he'd ring a bell and give them some food. Now, when you walk into a room when you're hungry, what is something that starts happening to you automatically? You smell the food, what happens? Yeah, you start salivating, your mouth starts watering. So what does a dog do when it is about to be given food? It starts salivating. So what Pavlov discovered was if you ring the bell and then give the food, ring the bell, give the food, the dog starts to associate the bell and the food. It's not that there's some conceptual or logic-based system that leads the dog to know that bell, like there's nothing about being a bell that associates it with food. It's just from experience, bell and, I'm just gonna write food because I don't know how to draw dog food. It'll just look like something else. Bell and food end up going together. So here's the fascinating thing. Because the dog's expecting food, it starts to, salivate or mouth starts to water. So what was it that Pavlov discovered? Well, over time, all you have to do is dingling a bell and the dog will start salivating. This is what is called classical conditioning, where it's just you can get a human body or an animal body to respond to something which has nothing to do with it for reasons that are conditioning based. So the idea is just that the, the very nature of experience 
So the dog does not know. So here's the classic thing with the dog is that if you stop giving it the food, it'll still salivate. So it's not necessarily that the dog knows the food is coming because in cases where it doesn't know the food is coming because the food doesn't come, you just dingling the bell and it immediately starts salivating in the same way that, um, you know, a little kid, uh, or how many of you have a dog or a cat and have taken it to the vet? What happens the moment you get inside the vet's office very often with this animal? They get scared. They get, yeah, they get really scared. scared. Nothing's happened to them. They're just afraid. Why? Because they experience that. They have had past experience of being in this space. Then they get poked and prodded and get stabbed and things. So now why is it you take the dog in? Like you just go in and like look at the other dogs in a vet's office and they are freaking out usually. Why? Because that space is associated with past negative experiences. So in the same way, the the dingling of the bell is associated with the expectation of food, which causes the salivation. So this is the idea behind associationism. It's a purely mechanical process. If you put two things together, the brain and the mind assumes that if you get one, the other will come in the future. That's all associative learning is. So it's not rule-based, it's pure mechanical. And the cool thing about, um, there's a few things about associationism that are worth talking about. One is thus far we've been talking about language, but as the Pavlov experiment shows, it's not just words that can be associated. So how many of you, um, what is a food that you will never eat again? You've eaten it before, but you'll never have it again. Cauliflower. Cauliflower. What is your reason behind it? Just that it tastes awful? It's just, I just remember having it once at a diner and when I was like nine and then spinning it out like the second I tried it. How many of you had a food item that you used to love and can no longer eat? Anybody? Yeah, I have. Um, why I can have. you no longer eat it? Um, I'd say too many of them and now I just don't like them. Yeah, so here's... If you eat too many of anything, what starts to happen? You feel ill or you don't like the feeling. In a classic case, how many of you have had something and then gotten food poisoning from it? Anyone gotten food poisoning? You like go and get sushi and then the next day you spend the entire day throwing up. Anyone had this experience? For me, it was baby carrots when I was a kid. Um, I couldn't eat baby carrots for like 10 years because the taste of baby carrots immediately made me feel ill. This was a classic case of associationism. Why is it? Well, the feeling of illness was associated with the taste of baby carrots. Another one, if I say the word diarrhea right now to you, all of you, nobody's gonna get like a big smile on their face. You'll all have this, like it won't be very strong because it's not like I'm showing you diarrhea. But if you just hear that word, it will give you a sense of like, eh. Like you get a mild disgust reaction. Again, that is an associative experience. It's not like you think about it step by step of like diarrhea is feces. Feces is bad for me. Therefore, I should feel disgust. It's literally just a mechanical process. Boom, boom. Um, so that's what we're talking about with associationism. And so system one operates according to the theorists who believe in dual process theory. System one is operating in this very mechanical uh, sort of associative way. So going back to our question from last time, why is it that people are more likely to say that cops, this person who believes in law and order and uh, the number one thing they care about in the election is um, the, the funding for the police. Why is it that we people are going to commonly go, oh, this person's a cop who's voting for Trump. Well, because in our mind, there's an association between people who vote for Trump and people who have these beliefs. And so therefore, we don't run this big rule-based thing in terms of like, this is a subset of this and this causes this. It's rather just a pure association of, oh, that person loves law and order, therefore that person loves, or like law and order Trump. It's a mechanical connection. We don't even go through rule by rule and follow it. So that's what we mean by associationism. Interestingly, uh, analogies. So um, 
Yeah, and so another way of thinking about this is there's an, um, actually, Kaywin, I'm going to, I feel like this is going to uh, lead me down a rabbit hole. So I'm just going to smile at your question and not address it. So Alan asks, is system one sort of like behaviorism? So one thing to say about system one is that, um, this is a really good question, Alan. The idea is that what system one is doing is it's not quite like behaviorism because behaviorists say that there's nothing going on in the head and all there is are the behaviors. However, one commonality is that the sort of learning that was used in behaviorism of conditioning and you do this comes to be associated with that is the sort of learning process that is involved in system one. So a behaviorist is going to say, all that you need to worry about is uh, behaviors. According to dual process theory, they don't want to throw out the mind. They believe there is the mind and they believe there are things in it. However, what they're going to say is all the stuff that behaviorists said was true are true because we have this associative system. So the same sort of processes and the same sorts of experiments that someone like Skinner gave the, what a dual process theory is going to say is going to be that Skinner was right that operant conditioning works, and it works because part of our mind is an associative sort of system. And interestingly, uh, they've actually done some really cool studies because one of the cool things about associationism and the ideas with associatedness is that everything, the mind becomes like a web, like Ray said. So you've got an idea of, let's say, dog. Dog is going to be associated with other things in your head. So what is dog also going to be associated with? What are some things that pop in your head when you think dog? Bark. What else? Cat. Stick, because you're throwing a stick to a dog. And so here's a cool thing, leash. And then what you can do is say that each one of these is going to be associated with other things. So what else is bark associated with? The mailman. Mail. So mailman for dog, but bark can also be associated with tree. A uh, different type of bark, but also same phrase. And um, dog might also be associated or Bark might be associated with mailman because the dog barks at the mailman. Now, because it's set up in a web like this, one cool thing is that if you give somebody one of these words, it will activate the other ones. And just the way that the human mind works, and one of the evidences for associative networks, is the way that you can give somebody one word, and it will, the phrase is prime them for something else. So one of the classic cases of this is uh, the experiment was run by somebody named Barg at NYU, B-A-R-G-H. And the way the experiment worked was you gave people a series of five words and you asked them, you told them one of these words doesn't belong, the others do, uh, and tell me what sentence they form. So here's one of them. Um, relaxing, dinosaurs, very retirement is. So what is a four word sentence that can be made out of these five words? Like a sensible sentence. What of these five things doesn't belong in a sentence? The other four do. Relaxing dinosaurs, very retirement is. Dinosaur is very relaxing. I mean, I guess a dinosaur could be very relaxing. Retirement is very relaxing. It's generally the more uh, common one. So yeah, retirement, you no longer have a job. It's very relaxing. So they gave people a bunch of sentences like this. This isn't a very fun task. The interesting thing, though, was half the people got sentences with words like this one that, and other words like this, Florida dentures, wrinkles. What do all these words, what are they related to, all these words? 
Florida, dentures, wrinkles, retirement, old people. Yeah, these half the people got words associated with old people. The other half did not. Now, did they ask the they asked subjects, did you notice any patterns? They were like, no. But interestingly, they then asked, and this was actually the thing they were measuring, they asked the people to walk down the hall to grab a cup of water during a break period. And they measured how fast and how slow people walked. Interestingly, who walked faster? The people who had had the words about old people or the people who didn't have the words about the old people? Any guesses? Yeah, basically, if you had just answered a whole bunch of words about it, like your sentences included words about old people, they found that you took longer to walk down the hall than somebody who had no words about old people. That's a pretty fascinating explanation. Like, that's a pretty fascinating discovery. Like, if you read a bunch of words about old people, you're more likely to walk slower. And there's been a lot of studies on this. People who, like, the more you read things about money, generally, uh, the more thrifty you are. And like, there's all sorts of weird associations. And so the idea is, how would a, how would somebody who accepts just dual process, like, like Fodor, who thinks it's all rules, how would they explain this fact? Well, you could maybe say that they're running rules, but a simpler explanation is that well, we've got this system that relies on associative learning and you walk slower because seeing a word like Florida activates your thought of old people, your thought of old people associates with your walking slowly and therefore you walk more slowly when you have a bunch of words about old people. So that's the first one, associative uh, learning and rule-based. So the second one, I'm going to erase it. I'm gonna uh, shut off the camera for one second so I can write a question up here. As soon as the camera comes back on, I'll do a countdown. I want you to answer the following question that's written on the board as quickly as possible. All right, everyone ready? Are we good? I want some thumbs. I'm gonna turn this on and I want you to answer the question that's gonna be on your right side of the board as quickly as possible. Hopefully I spelled everything right and my uh, writing is not terrible. Three, two, one, go. A bat and a ball together cost $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Write down the first answer that comes to your mind as quickly as possible. Go, go, go. How much does the ball cost? All right, so bat and the ball together cost 110. Bat costs a dollar more than the ball. So how much does the ball cost? So uh, let's now, let's now uh, do this one as a math problem. We're gonna go step by step by step. Here is going to be how it works. So let's do some algebra. The price of the ball is what we're trying to find out. X is the price of the ball. And we said that the ball and the bat together equals $1.10. And we've said that the price of the bat is a dollar more than the price of the ball. So it'd be X plus x plus 1 equals 110. That's just the math problem. So what's our next step in our thing? Well, what's x plus x plus 1? Anyone remember their algebra? How many x's do we have? 2x um. Two plus 1 equals 110. Now what do we do? We subtract by 1. Both subtract sides. 1, which is 2x equals 0 0.10. Divided by two. Divided by two. So x equals 0.05, which is five cents. 
awesome. How many of you got five cents immediately? How many of you quickly just got this answer? Was there anyone, when I did this the first time, my gut answer was, I mean, the most common gut answer is one and uh, 10, but that's not right. Very often people say one and one 10. So what is this designed to show? Well, when you think immediately and you just go, well, short answer, one and one 10, the short answer that's given, also, if you were getting like, if I didn't explain the question well, because I was forcing you to go quickly, um, one, that means I didn't word it well, and I'm sorry, but two, that was part of the point, that these sorts of questions, to get the right answer in this, you have to take your time and go step by step. If you just go with a gut feeling like this, you end up with a crazy sort of answer, or at the very least, a not right answer. So this sort of problem is designed to show that when you go in this step-by-step -step, rule based way, it is slow. You are thinking slowly. It takes time. Also, then when you're doing the associative sense, it's much quicker. So when I asked you the bread and butter question, it didn't take you long to say butter. When I asked you Donald, it didn't take you long to say duck or Trump. In this case, though, to work through the right answer, it takes time. All right. Um, so those are the first two. Everyone on board with these first two. All right. I'm now going to do something that I'm very bad at, but we'll see if it works. Screen sharing. Um, here's the background. If you've seen this experiment before, uh, don't give it away to everyone else. Here's the, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you a video. Uh, it gives you the instructions. I don't know if when I square, square, blah, blah, share the screen, you can hear what they're saying, but basically here's the video. It is, I want you to watch this video and tell me how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball to each other. I want a correct answer and I want you to make sure you get it right. So let me pull up the YouTube video. Let me share my screen. Share screen. Where's the share? Can everyone see the screen right now? So selective attend. Can people see it? I need thumbs up. It should be a screen that says selective attention test. Is it there? Okay. I can see it. Okay, yeah. awesome. Watch this test. Count how many times they pass the ball back and forth to each other. Ready, steady, go. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? How many passes did you count in the chat? Because I can't see anyone right now. If I can get the chat up. 11. All right. 11, 13, bit laggy, but 13. Um, did anyone notice anything weird during this? There's the monkey. Yeah. How many of you saw the, the gorilla or the monkey? Out of curiosity, did anyone not notice it? It took, some people took a while. This one's not as clear as there was another version of the experiment that was even clearer. But here's basically, let me just play it for you all again. Go back, don't bother counting. Just watch. The correct answer, is 15. The correct answer was 15 passes, by the way. But did you see the gorilla? So let us watch, uh, just watch it again in slow-mo. Just don't pay attention to the counting. Just watch, just like watch the video. Yeah, uh, for those of you who didn't notice the first time, this video is from research by... there's a person dressed as a gorilla that walks into the middle of the screen. Um, it should be obvious when you actually go back and pause it. So like, yeah, like there's, it's pretty like when you pause it there and you're not looking for the passes, it's very obvious that there's a gorilla in the middle of the screen. However, in the original version of the experiment, I think, the, the way they got the numbers up were they actually offered people um, rewards. So uh, in this class, if you've seen it before, it's hard to miss the gorilla. But the first time you see it, it's really like if you're only paying attention to the white 
pat players or the players in white passing, then it's very difficult to notice there's a gorilla in the middle of the screen. Why? What is it? Well, this is designed to show this thing attention. What are you doing if you're counting the players in white? What is what are you doing? How much effort is that taking? How much focus is it taking? actually taking like a pretty decent amount of focus your focus is because these also these people aren't very good at basketball so like there's the one time the guy like bobbles it so it's unclear it's a little laggy you're on a screen there what this is showing is basically what you're doing with that that process of counting people in white passing the basketball you're running a rule-based system the rule is every time somebody wearing white passes the basketball count up by one that is following rules and it's taking your focus. Therefore, when you are doing this sort of thing, uh, you can't have your attention on something else. Noticing what somebody, a particular individual in black is doing when your attention is entirely elsewhere shows that this thing, attention is a mixed, uh, like it requires, it's a limited resource attention. You can think of it kind of like a spotlight. When the spotlight is on one part of the stage, you're not really paying attention to the rest of the stage. So in the same way, when your attention is focused on just the ball being passed by people in white, you don't notice that there's somebody dressed as a gorilla. Um, another one, yeah, there's an Instagram uh, prank going around where a girlfriend shows her boyfriend a video of an attractive girl in a bikini and then asks what color her bike was. Yeah, the girl in the bikini gets all the attention. I saw one the other day, another Instagram, um, this guy is sitting there playing Xbox really closely and his wife walks in and says, here, hold the baby for a second. I've got to take care of something. Guy doesn't even look up. He just, she puts on his lap a doll and he doesn't notice for 20 minutes that he's holding a doll and not an actual baby. Why? Because his attention was fully focused on the Xbox. So attention is another thing. If I had instead asked you, just if I would given you a list of words, every time I give you a word, tell me quickly what comes up. So if I just write like Donald and ask you, what's the first word to come into your mind while I showed you this video of the gorilla, you'd notice the gorilla. Why? Because association doesn't take much attention. It's quick, it's easy. So this is the difference, requires attention, no attention. That's a third criteria of difference. And attention is actually a fascinating thing in its own right. All right. Everyone on board with what attention is and how associations don't take much attention. Like you can be thinking about something else in the background and still be able to do it. But something rule following seems to require this focus. All right, little effort versus intensive effort. Um, if I were to try to carry on a conversation with you, just ordinary speaking, would we be able to walk uh, besides each, like imagine we were in the same spot, not halfway across the country from each other or wherever we are. We're walking. How many of you have been able to walk and chat with a friend? This is also a test of are you alive right now? How many of you have ever been able to carry on a conversation while walking? Yeah, come on, come on, who's here and alive? You should hopefully be able to, yeah. It's not hard to carry on a conversation while you're walking. However, if your friend were suddenly to ask you, all right, quick, I need a, I need a very quick answer. Um, if you count backwards from 99 by 2.5 and subtract it three times, uh, what's the number you get? Go. What is almost everyone going to do in that situation? You're walking with your friend and they ask you this question. What happens? Anyone know? You probably stop. Yeah, you stop walking. Why? Because the amount of energy it takes to walk, when you're, when you're carrying out a conversation, it doesn't take much effort. The interesting thing about speaking is uh, whether it's associative or not is something else, but it is a fast, not attention-based thing. Sometimes you can like find yourself talking to someone and realize that you've just been carrying on a conversation, but your mind is elsewhere. However, doing a hard math problem requires effort and thinking energy. And because of this, it becomes very difficult to use the energy required to walk and to think very hard at the same time. So very often, if somebody asks you a tough question, people will almost always just stop walking. And it's not like you consciously decide. It's just all of a sudden, the energy that was being used to walk gets redirected, and all of a sudden, you stop. That's what we're talking about with effort or energy, is rule-based 
tough thinking requires you to put in energy. And because of this, certain sorts of things come out. So also another fact they've done, um, interestingly suggesting that rule-based tough thinking involves energy and associative thinking does not, is they've done all sorts of studies of people, uh, I mean, from our everyday life, is it easier to do a hard, how many of you have taken a math test and the night before you slept like crap, like just complete crap before a test? I mean, I have. How did you do, a, how did you find the test? Was it easier or harder than usual? Not so different for Ray. So Ray's good at taking tests. Some people are just good test takers. Has anyone ever had the experience like, has anyone ever tried to take a test on like one hour of sleep? Like just like you didn't sleep at all? Like it's an event, it, it is a true adventure. Um, you can't remember where it started. You know, you forget halfway through what is math? What does this number mean? Like who the hell knows? So pulling an all nighter and no energy for the test. And basically what this shows is in a test you are requiring your system to. Test taking is designed to require active thinking. That's why we have tests on things like, you know, tough math problems. Nobody asks you like, your, your, the SAT didn't ask you, what is the answer to this? Like that one we all know. So what this is designed to show is that difficult thinking requires energy and effort. And it's the same resource of energy and effort that are used for other things like walking or like sleeping. Like it's also, um, if you run a marathon, it's then very difficult to think afterwards. Why? Because the energy required to think straight and think clearly and go step by step is the same pool of energy required to, you know, that you've depleted running. Um, how many of you get hangry? Anyone other than me get hangry? And by hangry, I mean, whenever you're hungry, you become angry and just a total dick. Yeah, I'm totally guilty of it. Why? Well, because one of the things that goes away when your blood sugar is low is your control over what you're doing. What hanger is, is a situation in which because your effort levels, you have less effort to draw upon, you fall back on system one and you end up, what you end up doing is if somebody says something in like, they say a word you don't like, instead of being like, oh yes, you're right. I understand the core of what you're saying is a good point. You're instead just like, the response is something like, what'd you say about my shoes? Or, you know, so that hanger is a classic case of uh, you are less able to apply effort or use energy when there's less there. And because rule-based thinking requires energy when you're lower energy or less well-fed or less hydrated or tired, you're not going to think as well and you fall back and you end up thinking in these ways that seem more association-based. Um, so there's this fascinating study. This is also like a terrifying study. Um, what is, per have I mentioned the parole study yet in this class, which is one of my favorite, another one of my favorite studies, um, the Israeli parole judges study. Does that, is anyone familiar with this? All right, so what is parole in like the everyday context? What is parole? It's a cop term or a legal term. So if you say you get go to jail, so here you go to say you you uh, you steal five thousand dollars and you go to jail for five years. You're in jail for three years and you've been really 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 well behaved. They might allow you to get out early if you've been really well behaved. But if they let you out early, they don't just like put you out on the streets. Instead, you have to check in. With, they say you can go out. You've been well behaved, you're allowed out into the world, but every week you have to check in with somebody, a cop, and make sure that you're still where you're supposed to be. There's certain rules. This is parole. Going out on parole is being allowed out of jail with certain restrictions. So you're not allowed to do whatever you want. There's usually controls on where you can go, but that's what parole is. So parole is basically a uh, practice in which criminals or somebody who's been in prison is allowed out with certain restrictions. So if you've been in prison, it's a great thing because you don't want to be in prison. That's a life lesson. Don't go to prison. Next, um, who decides whether you get parole? Anyone know? 
I think the judge. Yeah, there's a judge. There's a parole judge. Their job is literally just to look at the applications for parole and decide whether this person should be allowed to go on parole. Um, this is come like this should be a rule based intensive sort of process because you have to read the person's application. You have to see what they're what they were in jail for what the evidence was, how they behaved in jail, whether you think they're going to be a risk to be a bad person in the future. So in is this Israeli uh, uh, parole court that they looked at, they found that on average, if you took every single parole case that everyone who was up for parole, 35% of people were given parole. So about one out of every three people that went up for parole was given parole. However, they found this both fascinating and terrifying fact, which is it wasn't that it was 35% all throughout the day. Given what we've just been talking about, does anyone have any idea? So let me just show you what the uh, judge's daily schedule looked like. So let's say they start at 9, 9 a.m., and then they had from noon to 1, there was a lunch break. So 12 to 1, there was a lunch break. And then from uh, let's see nine to then from one two it'd be four to five there was another lunch break so how many hours is that that's three six and then they worked from five to seven so this was a break this was a break anyone have any guesses for what this graph looks like where this if we draw this up here this would be a hundred percent get parole. This would be 0% get parole. Anyone have any idea what this graph looks like? So when was it gonna be highest? Which points on the chart is it gonna be highest percentage of people were given uh, parole? Yeah, so highest after breaks, lower in the mornings and nights. So actually what they found is, Alan, you're halfway right, which is at, right after a lunch break, it was at 65%. Right after the afternoon snack break was 65%. And right at the start of the day, it was 65%-ish. Right before the break, it dropped to zero. So when these judges were hungry, no one got parole. What's the number one thing which should determine whether you get parole? Well, it should be how good of a case you have, how well behaved you were. And what did they discover with this? The number one determiner is when did the judge last eat? If you go in the 10 minutes before the judge is about to have their afternoon snack, you aren't getting parole, like period. It was literally in the 10 minutes before breaks was always at 0%. So yeah, judges get hangry, which is kind of a problem of, and what this is designed to show is the sort of thinking that is requires effort becomes very difficult when you're hungry. And so what did these judges do? They fell back on their sort of associative base level system, which is just like, well, you know, most, most of these people don't deserve to be on the streets. Criminals don't deserve to be on the streets. I'm not gonna look at it closely. I'll fall back on my associative, nobody gets parole. So what this case shows is, well, one, anytime you wonder like, is hanger real? Yes, hanger is very real. Two, uh, you aren't the only one who does it. People's lives depend on hanger. Um, so are there systems that are now made to counteract these effects? Uh, my guess is they now encourage judges to bring snacks. But like, seriously, there's nothing like most of it. There's not like some brilliant system in place. And, you know, this is the sort of thing that uh, it's kind of terrifying that these everyday sorts of things have major impacts on people's lives and their well-being. But yeah, this is a classic case and what this is designed to show with system one and system two is that system two is how you should be deciding this, but it becomes way harder and you fall back on system one in times in which you're low energy. So this is just one of a very, very clear case of this. All right, the last difference is um, tied to feeling of agency. So this one's pretty straightforward and this ties in with the conscious versus unconscious. When you just have like, when bread and butter pops into your head, it doesn't really feel like you're the one thinking about it. It's almost like a passive thing of it just popped into your head. If I make a face at you and you laugh, it's generally not that you like 
analyze like, oh, that's a funny face. Funny faces make you laugh. It doesn't feel like you're doing it. It just kind of happens to you. Contrast that with on a test. Like uh, if you do well on a test, there's a sense of pride or I did that thing. So that's the final difference. And this one's not as important. It's just the difference is that um, this feeling of agency for system two processing and the sense of it just kind of happens in the background for the system one processing. All right, so does everyone understand the fundamental differences here between system one and system two, or at least what it's supposed to be system one and system two? Um, we're doing all right with it. This is basically, we basically covered all I wanted to say today. I just want to quickly review and then say where we're going to be going next week. Um, so are we all on board with what the difference between the two systems are? All right, so the idea then is that people who believe in dual process theory believe that we can explain facts like the photo problems in terms of our having two systems, but there have been people who have gone back and said, no, 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 no. Things that you think are system one are actually to be understood in terms of actual reasoning that's just happening on an unconscious level. So what they want to divide is say everything system two, or at least many more things are system two than people like um, Kahneman and the dual process theorists say. It's just that we need to incorporate this other thing, conscious versus unconscious reasoning. So what we're going to do next time is talk about one of the uh, people who's the strongest view that everything is system two and there isn't associative learning and how this guy attempts to like he points to problems with the sort of Kahneman dual process approach whether he's right or not and his colleagues I'm not really sure at the end of the day how to feel about it this is pretty new research but uh it's an interesting idea of maybe we can explain these sorts of considerations not in terms of two systems but rather in terms of a different sort of way of cutting it all right uh, your papers are due Thursday. Get them in to me uh, unless you have an extension. They have to be in by the end of the day. If you run a few hours over, I'm not up in the middle of the night. So as long as they're in my inbox by the next or in the blackboard by the next morning, don't worry about it. Um, I'm going to stop the recording here and tell everyone to have a good time unless you're